There is a divine technique whispered amongst the gods of the multiverse. This technique is the result of breaking one's limitations, unlocking the vast potential hidden within as they become a being of pure power. This technique is known as Ultra Instinct. Initially known exclusively to the angels of the multiverse, only a few gods of destruction know how to utilize this ability. Even fewer mortals across the multiverse know about this technique, let alone access it. One of these mortals was a martial artist from Universe 7 known as Son Goku. After a lifetime of intense battles and shattering his limits, Goku was able to ascend beyond the realm of gods and obtain this ultimate form. However, what if he broke through godhood earlier? What if Goku was able to go beyond his mortal limits and achieve enlightenment earlier in life? How would this event ripple across space and time? The course is set for history to change forever. The road to enlightenment begins. What if Goku unlocked Ultra Instinct early? Let's get those punches flying! It is age 750. At only 13 years old, the boy known as Son Goku had entered the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai, also known as the Strongest Under the Heavens Tournament. Fighters from across the world would gather in order to challenge each other in a tournament to determine who was the greatest fighter in the world. Goku loved the idea of this tournament, and had been preparing for it for over a year through his training with his rival, Krillin, and master, the invincible turtle hermit known as Roshi. Despite all his training, however, Goku had lost against the incredibly skilled and powerful martial artist known as Jackie Chun. Despite Goku's best efforts, he was unable to defeat the elderly master. Throughout the battle, Jackie Chun unleashed many bizarre and effective techniques, ranging from the Sleepy Boy technique to the Electric Shock Surprise. However, one of the most bizarre techniques Jackie Chun used was the Drunken Fist, a technique which mimicked the movements of a drunk person. Goku didn't know that. All he knew was that this was a cool technique his deceased grandpa, Son Gohan, used to know. After the climactic final match between Goku and Jackie Chun, the announcer declared Jackie the winner of the tournament. Jackie Chun left the arena as Goku and Krillin went up to congratulate the mysterious fighter on his well-earned victory. Jackie Chun thanks the boys for their kind words and walks away, waving goodbye as he leaves. This is where our story begins to change. It's a small change, so small that it doesn't even seem to matter. But the consequences of this small change will leave lasting ripple effects throughout history. As Jackie Chun begins to walk away, Goku remembers something he wanted to ask the old man as he runs up to him once more. Jackie asks the boy what's on his mind as Goku asks him what does drunk mean. After Jackie gets back up from the ground, he asks Goku why he'd even ask that question in the first place. Goku says, out of all the things he saw him do, the drunken fist looked like it would be the most useful. Not only that, it was a move that his grandpa used to know. If he could learn how to move like that, he'd not only get stronger, but it'd also make him feel a bit closer to his grandpa. Jackie Chun is left dumbfounded. He really doesn't want to explain to a child about alcohol and how to get drunk. But he also doesn't want to dismiss the question because this was something that meant a lot to Goku. 
with sweat beads falling down his face. Jackie Chun nervously describes the drunken fist technique as PG as possible. Well, uh, you see, it's quite simple. By uh, moving in unpredictable movements and moving your body without thinking, then you, you can go reach a whole new level of martial arts. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Krillin was rather doubtful of Jackie's claims, but Goku, on the other hand, believed it completely. He was excited, moving without thinking. If his grandpa could do it, then so could he. Goku thanks Jackie Chun one more time for answering his question as he gives him a big smile. Jackie recomposes himself and tells the boys to continue their training before he leaves. After meeting back up with his friends and eating to his heart's content, Goku told them all that he'll be leaving to find the four-star Dragon Ball. Not only that, he told Krillin and Master Roshi that he'll try to figure out this moving without thinking thing on any fighters he comes across. They sweat a little and laugh nervously as Goku bids his farewells before taking off. During his journey, Goku came across the despicable Red Ribbon Army, who were also after the Dragon Balls. Goku had little trouble taking out General Silver and the many Red Ribbon soldiers in his path, but whenever Goku faced a tough opponent, he would try to use the Drunken Fist to the best of his ability with mixed results. While facing off against the Ninja Murasaki, Goku attempted to move without thinking, which only resulted in the Ninja Star to the back of the head. During his battles against General Blue, Goku tried it again, which only made him an easy target for Blue's telekinesis. Goku even attempted it once more during his fight with the mercenary Tao Pai Pai, but all it led to was a swift kick to the face. Every time, Goku had to change strategies in order to defeat his foes. Even as he was storming through the gates of the Red Ribbon Headquarters, Goku was rather upset about this. For the first time in his life, he wasn't able to get a grasp of a martial arts technique. He was able to pick up the Kamehameha, but he wasn't able to move his body differently? What was he doing wrong? Goku continued pondering this as he finished off Officer Black and dismantled the rest of the Red Ribbon Army. When Goku's allies came to lend their help, they were all utterly shocked to see Goku standing on top of the decimated remains of the army's headquarters. Goku told his friends all about his journey, his climb up Korn's tower, and the raid of Muscle Tower. Everyone was surprised to hear of Goku's accomplishments, especially Master Roshi. However, as Goku was talking, he realized that he actually had a question. He went up to his master and told him that he couldn't figure out how to move without thinking. It was something that Jackie Chun and his own grandpa could do, but he couldn't. He wondered if he was doing something wrong. Master Roshi paused for a moment and chuckled. Despite all of his absurd strength, Goku was still a young boy with his own worries and doubts. Roshi looks at the crestfallen Goku as he lightly bonks him on the head with his staff. Listen here, Goku! Learning how to move on your own without thinking isn't something you can overcome with brute force! It isn't even something that most prodigies can accomplish! A technique as advanced as that can only come through experience! Facing many strong opponents throughout your life will allow your body to get the experience it needs to react on its own. It's a gradual process that slowly comes over time. Roshi looks at the young boy and realizes that not only is Goku looking back at him and listening intensely, Yamcha and Krillin are also looking at him quite sheepishly. The old master understands that these words coming out of his mouth need to reach through not only Goku, but to these young fighters as well. In fact, Yamcha and Krillin need to hear this more than anyone. 
they are well aware of the fact that Goku has severely outclassed them in nearly every way, and it's left them feeling dejected and discouraged. Roshi pauses for a moment before he looks at his students. Have I ever told you boys the reason why martial arts exists? It wasn't made to prove your strength to others or pick up girls. It was made out of necessity. Martial arts was created as a way to defend oneself and others against overwhelming threats. Back in my day, when I was a young whippersnapper like yourselves, a terrible evil descended upon the land. Roshi explained that, long ago, a demon and his army of monsters overran the world and plunged it into darkness. No army or machine could compare to the massive power these beasts held. Not even Roshi himself could do much against them at the time. However, his master was not deterred. Despite knowing that he was much weaker than the demon and his monsters, he used his martial arts to fight back against them, and even developed a martial arts technique to seal the demon away. Without his efforts and determination, the world would have fallen into chaos. Always remember that, no matter how powerful your opponent may be, you can overcome the odds through martial arts! Never forget your training! Move well, study well, play well, rest well. That is the turtle way! As long as you follow these principles, there's nothing you can't do! This pep talk seemed to work as Goku, Krillin, and Yamcha appeared to be motivated and moved by these words. Roshi pats himself on the back, thinking to himself that he still knows how to make good speeches. They still need the Dragon Balls to revive Upa's father, who was still killed by Mercenary Tao in this timeline. So, after Bulma determines that the radar can't detect the final Dragon Ball, the gang set off to the palace of Fortune Teller Baba. Goku and his friends compete in Baba's tournament in order to receive a free vision and the initial battles go as expected. During the final match between Goku and the mysterious Masked Fighter, Goku takes Master Roshi's words to heart as he tries to strategize and outmaneuver this experienced opponent. He was even able to counter many of his attacks. At one point, Goku attempted to utilize his own version of the Drunken Fist where he would go limp and attempt to dodge the Masked Man's attack. Unfortunately, the enigmatic fighter was able to anticipate Goku's moves and see through this technique, unveiling his very own drunken fist. This bewildered Goku, giving the masked man an opportunity to grab his tail, incapacitating him. Thankfully, Goku's tail came off due to the masked man repeatedly throwing around the boy as he quickly conceded the match. It was then revealed that the masked man was none other than Goku's deceased grandfather, Son Gohan. After a tearful reunion, Gohan stated that he was surprised Goku knew the drunken fist as he looked at Roshi. With a raised eyebrow, he asks Roshi if he ever gave Goku any alcohol, as Roshi angrily exclaims he did no such thing. Goku, not understanding what they're talking about, tells his grandpa that he plans on fighting stronger guys and learning how to move without thinking so he can be as skilled and strong as him. Gohan chuckles as he pats Goku's head. <laughs> silly boy, you shouldn't strive to be as strong as me. No, you should instead work towards becoming even stronger, faster, smarter. Push through your limits, Goku, and keep training hard. As long as you stick with your friends and train together, there's nothing you can't accomplish. Goku smiles as he hugs his grandpa one more time. Before Gohan leaves, Goku asks him to train hard too, because he plans to fight him again one day when he's stronger. 
Gohan smiles as he gives Goku a peace sign, stating that he'll be waiting for him in the other world when that day comes. Goku gives him a peace sign back as Grandpa Gohan returns to the afterlife. Goku uses Baba's vision to locate the final Dragon Ball and, after defeating the Pilaf gang once more, Goku returns to summon Shenron and bring back Upa's father from the dead. With his quests now completed, Goku goes to his friends to tell them his plan to train for the next World Martial Arts Tournament in three years' time. At first, he wants to train with Yamcha, Krillin, and Roshi, but Roshi states that he's far exceeded them long ago. Instead, he should travel the world on foot and see the many bizarre lands, fighters, and experiences that life has to offer. Goku nods enthusiastically as he says his goodbyes before running off into the distance. During these three years of development, Yamcha begins training under Master Roshi as a new Turtle School student. Thanks to Master Roshi's earlier speech, Yamcha and Krillin are more motivated than ever before to continue their training with their goals set on overcoming their limits and beating Goku. Even Roshi starts to train, realizing that he should follow the example of his students and push beyond his own limits as well. Instead of training in secret, however, Roshi decides that it would be best to train with his students and take a more hands-on approach to teaching this time around seeking to develop their strengths and overcoming their weaknesses while doing the same for himself. Meanwhile, Goku travels the world and, just as Roshi told him, he encounters many bizarre fighters such as thieves with magical gourds, demons, and even past versions of his own master. Goku had no idea how he got there. One moment he was sleeping in the woods, and the next thing he knew, he was falling headfirst into a hot spring. Goku didn't really think too much about it, using this as an opportunity to learn from Roshi's master on how to tap into a mysterious power known as Spirit's Energy. While in the past, Goku asks the invincible master Mutaito what it takes to move without thinking. Moving without thinking, eh? That sounds an awful lot like enlightenment to me. Huh? Enlightenment? What's that? I don't need a light. I don't mean a literal light. It's a... spiritual awakening. According to ancient texts written by the masters of old, by going through extensive physical, spiritual, and mental training, it's possible to awaken yourself. To go beyond your sense of self and become aware of all things. To see the underlying truth of the universe. Wow, that's... a whole lot of words. I don't get it. Ha! <laughs> yeah, I don't get it either. What I got from reading those old scrolls is that we, as martial artists, should strive to continue our training with our minds bodies and souls, while making sure we stay healthy. This also means taking care of ourselves in times of turmoil, too. Losing yourself to your emotion or human desires will not only cloud your judgment, but your soul, too. Breaking your connection between the mind, body, and soul can stop you from achieving enlightenment. Oh, okay. I'll do my best not to do that, then. Thanks, old-timer. <laughs> Take care of yourself, kid. Once he left the temple, Goku helped his young master to defeat his rival Shen, tapping into spirit energy for the very first time. However, when Goku ran through the Sea of Flames, he blinked as he soon realized he had returned to the same forest he was the day before. Somehow, some way. After returning to the present, Goku eventually settles on a lush, tropical jungle where he decides to live and survive in the wild like he used to. By trading his senses to hunt larger, more dangerous and elusive animals, 
Goku believes he'll be able to enhance these senses which he can then use during battle. Reflecting on his lessons with Roshi, Goku remembers some of the more mundane lessons Roshi taught that he initially wrote off as boring. He recalls Roshi's advice about meditation and how, by becoming more attuned with his spirit and ki, he could unlock a whole new world of martial arts. Goku begins meditating, but it's rather difficult. Not only are there so many sounds and smells in the jungle, large dinosaurs and tigers try to attack him while he's meditating. This goes on for many months as Goku continues meditating while dodging attacks from wild animals. One day, as Goku is meditating on a tree stump, concentrating deeply, he starts to notice something. Despite having his eyes closed, he sees bright flickers of yellow lights around him. Without realizing it, Goku had achieved the ability to sense Ki. With this new ability, Goku was able to dodge the incoming attacks of a vicious, saber-toothed tiger. Goku punches the beast as he yells out happily that he finally did it! With this new technique, he'd be one step closer to moving without thinking. Previously, Ligma. Huh? Now, three years pass as the 22nd Tenkaichi Budokai is set to begin. Goku reunites with his friends and enters a tournament, excited to see what kind of strong fighters he'd be facing this time. However, from far away, three figures clad in a green uniform watch Goku and his friends intensely. The old master rubs his chin with a snicker forming on his face. <laughs> These were the new students of the Kame style? Two kids and a lanky street rat? Roshi really has grown senile over the years. The shortest one eyes the turtle students before asking his companion with the third eye a question. Do you think there'll be any trouble, Tien? Not at all. They look like shoddy martial artists with no skill or grace. Master Shen has nothing to worry about. <laughs> Once this tournament starts, I'll make sure to teach those pathetic amateurs what real martial arts is. After sweeping through the preliminary matches and getting introduced to the students of the Crane School, it is now time for the main tournament matches to commence. In this first match, it's Yamcha versus the Crane School's top student, Ten Shinhan. Tien and Yamcha enter the ring as Tien thinks to himself that this will be an easy match. The battle commences and Tien is surprised to see that he had underestimated his foe. Due to all the training he received from Roshi, as well as his goal to defeat Goku motivating him, Yamcha has risen beyond his old self and reached new heights. Caught off guard, Tien is forced to stay on the defensive as he begins to enjoy himself with this fight. Yamcha and Tien exchange blows as Yamcha sees an opening. After sweeping Tien's leg and kicking him forward, Yamcha unleashes his new and improved technique, the Neo Wolf Fang Fist. It connects, and it deals a considerable amount of damage. Tien is sent flying out of the arena. However, it isn't enough to knock out Tien, as he is able to catch himself on the edge of the ring. Tien looks at the man in front of him and... He apologizes. Huh? What for? I'm sorry for not taking this fight seriously before. I believed you were simply a bragger and a fool. But I was wrong. You are a very skilled warrior, and you're fighting with everything you've got. I recognize you now as a true martial artist, and it's only fair if I go all out too. Tien gathers his key as his body begins to contort, 
two extra arms grow from his back as Tien reveals his four witches technique. Tien states that he didn't think he'd be revealing a move like this so early on in the tournament. He yells at Yamcha to bring it on. Yamcha obliges as the two fighters exchange blow after blow. However, Yamcha isn't able to keep up with all the extra limbs. Tien capitalizes on this by striking at Yamcha with a flurry of blows. Tien parries one of Yamcha's hits and gut punches Yamcha with two spare fists. He then picks him up and throws him off the ring, winning the match. Tien goes down to lend a hand to Yamcha as he accepts it, thanking him for the match as Yamcha congratulates him. You know, I figured you to be the cold and brooding type, but you're a pretty chill guy. I guess we both got off on the wrong foot, huh? Hmm. Yeah, perhaps. Let's fight again sometime! I'll keep on training to take you out and my rivals! What? You mean there are others as strong as you? As strong as me? Ha, <laughs> no way! Krillin is already way ahead of me by now. And Goku? <sighs> He's on a whole nother world of power! Just wait until you fight him. You'll see what I mean. As Yamcha leaves the arena, Tien smiles to himself as his curiosity and excitement swells within him. Perhaps this tournament can provide him what he's always been seeking. An ultimate rival who can bring him the fight he's always been waiting for. After watching this amazing fight, Goku gets pumped up as he can't wait to fight against this new strong fighter. For the next few matches, Jackie Chun easily defeats the Angry Man Wolf as Krillin faces off against the strange telepath known as Chaozu. Although Chaozu is able to use bizarre yet powerful techniques such as flight, telekinesis, and the Dodonpa, Krillin is able to knock out the boy with a powerful Kamehameha. Krillin wins the match without resorting to math. Tien and Goku were impressed at seeing Krillin's performance, as Tien starts wondering if this son Goku could possibly be any stronger. His suspicions are confirmed when, in the next match, Goku is able to easily defeat Pamput by hitting him so fast that his consecutive strikes looked like a single blow. Tien is impressed not only at Goku's speed and strength, but his self-control as well. During the first semi-final match between Tien and Jackie Chu, the old master proved to be quite a proficient fighter, with his myriad of techniques and years of experience to back him up. Just like with the battle against Yamcha, Tien was forced to reveal another one of his techniques, the Solar Flare. Tien wondered if this could be the fight he had been seeking, but Jackie Chu instead forfeits pleading for Tien to change his ways and become a force for good, as Tien wins the match by default. Angered by this, Tien confronts the old man after the match, revealing that he knew who he was. He was in fact the Turtle Master the whole time. Why did you do it? Why did you quit? Roshi explains that he realized that this new generation of fighters didn't need his guidance anymore. He's content with knowing that his students wouldn't slack off from their training. Roshi even includes Tien in that list of powerful new fighters. He once again asks Tien to renounce his evil ways and train with his pupils so that they can become stronger together. As he walks away, Roshi remarks to Tien that if this had been the old Roshi, he would have lost to him in the end. Tien barks at him asking him what he meant as Roshi simply leaves. Afterwards, the last semi-final match is set to begin. Goku vs. Krillin. The two rivals ask each other to not hold back as they rush into battle. The fight is long and intense, as Krillin is seemingly able to keep up with Goku. Goku is delighted to see just how strong Krillin has become over the years. As Krillin states that he couldn't have come this far without him, Yamcha, and their master. 
able to exchange flurries of blows, after images, and sneak attacks, but they aren't quite able to knock each other off the ring. In fact, it seems that Goku is able to anticipate every single move Krillin comes up with. Krillin attempts to use the Kamehameha, but Goku, after seeing Tien deflect Jackie's blast earlier on in the tournament, is able to divert it with these. As a last resort, Krillin unveils the move he had been working on for quite a while. He gathers his key and yells as electricity starts crackling over his hand. This was his own version of the Electric Shock Surprise! He dashes towards Goku with an electrified punch, but shockingly, Goku smiles as he calmly sidesteps the hit. Before Krillin can register what just happened, he is smacked away by Goku's tail. Goku then reveals that, although he's glad to see Krillin become stronger, he still has a lot of training to do. The Monkey Boy starts moving so fast that no one except Tien is able to see him anymore. He quickly delivers several rapid-fire kicks to Krillin, knocking him out of the ring and winning him the match. Yeah! It is now time for the final fight. Tien approaches Goku as the two fighters start to circle each other. The tension is thick in the air as both fighters struggle to keep their excitement in check. So, it's just you and me now, isn't it? Your friends have been hyping you up the entire day. After seeing their skills, I can't wait to see what you can do. Yeah, me too. I've seen some of the crazy moves you can do. You're probably the strongest guy i ever seen. Besides my grandpa, anyways. I'm so excited, I'm shaking. I see. It's a shame I have to kill you. Alright then. Don't disappoint me, son Goku! Both fighters lunge at each other with dazzling speed and ferocity. We are moving so fast that it's nearly impossible for anyone watching to understand what exactly is happening. With each leap and attack blocked, both fighters start to become more and more amazed at the other's power. Tien's attempts to grapple Goku are always met with a swift smack of his tail. Tien even prepares a volleyball fist, but the boy is able to sidestep the lunging punch and throw him onto his back. He starts to wonder how exactly Goku is able to predict where he's going to go. It is at this point Tien asks how the hell he's able to predict his movements as Goku declares that he can sense his ki, which stuns Master Roshi and Shen. Master Shen asks Chaozu to immobilize Goku with his telekinesis, so Tien can have a chance to kill him. However, Tien notices immediately, as he yells at his friend and master to stop. He renounces his evil ways, which leaves Shen furious. He's about to kill Chaozu, but he is stopped by a well-timed Kamehameha from Roshi, blasting him away. Now. With nothing holding them back, Goku and Tien resume fighting with renewed vigor. Tien displays the Four Witches technique once again as he launches himself at Goku. However, Goku doesn't move. Instead, he takes a deep breath as he closes his eyes. As Tien begins unleashing a devastating barrage of lightning-fast punches, his smile soon turns into a face of despair. None of his punches were connecting. Goku, he was dodging all of them! 
while sensing Tien's ki and thinking back to his training of dodging animals in the jungle. Goku was able to move his body without thinking. Goku dodged every single one of Tien's attacks as the crowd watched on with awe. Eventually, Tien ran out of stamina as he began gasping for air. Goku used this as his moment to strike. With one well-positioned roundhouse kick to the face, Tien was knocked out of bounds. For the first time ever, Goku had won the Tenkaichi Budokai. As the audience begins to roar in applause, Tien approaches Goku with a smile. Congratulations, Goku. Thank you for the fight. I've never faced someone as talented and tough as you. <laughs> Thanks a bunch, Tien. You're pretty strong too. I don't think I ever had a fight as fun as that. If you don't mind me asking, how do you move like that? How are you able to dodge all of my attacks? Oh, that? I just sensed your key and moved out of the way. I think it's pretty neat, but I know there's something better than that. One day, I plan on being able to move without thinking. Moving? Without thinking? <laughs> that sounds insane! Alright then, I'll aim to do that too. Let's train hard so we can break through our limits. When that day comes and we master this, moving without thinking, let's fight again. Okay then, that's a promise. The two fighters smile at each other as Goku's friends gather around. Goku realizes that he left his power pole and four-star Dragon Ball behind inside the tournament's resting area. Krillin tells him not to worry. He's the champion now. He doesn't need to go pick up something like that by himself. He'll do it for him. So, Krillin leaves to retrieve the item. A few moments later, a yell is heard coming from inside the resting area. When Goku and his friends arrive at the scene, they witness something horrible. They see the lifeless body of Krillin. Krillin? Krillin! What's wrong, Krillin? Wake up! Wake up! After years of intense battles and arduous training, Goku has reached one step closer to enlightenment. However, his journey has reached a dark turn as he holds the lifeless body of his best friend in his arms. Can Goku keep his emotions in check? Who murdered Krillin? Will Goku be able to reject his mortal desire for revenge and transcend into godhood? Find out next time on Dragon Ball! The Demon's Return Following his victory at the 22nd World Tournament, Goku is ready to celebrate with his friends. However, tragedy strikes. Krillin is discovered lifeless on the floor. Anger bubbles up within Goku, unlike anything he's ever experienced before. Will our heroes be able to face this new menace? Can Goku overcome this trial with his soul intact? Evil reigns now. Corruption at the hands of the devil. What if Goku unlocked Ultra Instinct early? Part 3. On what should be a time of celebration, dread and despair is all that remains. As Goku holds the body of his best friend, Krillin, he feels it start to slowly grow cold. He remembers how, only a few moments ago, he was smiling 
and excited over Goku's win against Ten Shinhan. And now, he was gone. An intense rage, unlike anything he had ever felt before in his life, was rising within the Monkey Boy. A bubbling fury that demanded steadfast retribution. Whoever did this to Krillin needed to pay! On the floor alongside Krillin was the barely living tournament announcer. Through great difficulty, he told the Z Fighters that a green monster suddenly appeared from the shadows, striking Krillin down before he even had a chance to fight back. He flew away, but not before dropping something on the ground. A piece of paper. Master Roshi picks up the paper, and he's terrified at what he sees. It was something he had hoped he would never have to see again. It was the symbol of the Demon King Piccolo. Somehow, some way, he had returned. The announcer tells them that this winged monster had just left, heading towards the west with the tournament registry and a shining orb. Goku grabs Bulma's Dragon Radar and yells out to the Flying Nimbus he was going to make that monster pay. Roshi orders Goku to stand down and calm himself. He was far too exhausted from the tournament matches to fight. Not only that, whatever this creature was, it was strong enough to kill Krillin of all people. Yet, Roshi's desperate pleas fall on deaf ears. Goku for the first time ever, ignores the cries of his master and friends as he flies off in search of vengeance. Roshi can only pray that Goku comes back alive. High above the skies, the green monster known as Tambourine flies in search of his next victim when he is stopped in his tracks by a yellow cloud. Goku had arrived, roaring in anger as he demanded that he give back the Dragon Ball and Krillin's life. Tambourine merely laughs, glad to hear that the bald freak was dead. He was worried about dealing with that shorty. He had a gut feeling that guy could have been a problem to deal with in a fight. Goku vows to avenge his best friend, lunging in to attack. Yet, Goku wasn't able to land a clean hit as he was swiftly kicked away. The monkey boy cursed. He really was more tired than he thought. But it was more than that. He was angry. Very angry. He wasn't able to focus as well as he used to. It was affecting his martial arts. Tambourine chuckles, eager to kill this brat while he can, as he fires a mouth to beam straight at King Taloon. The flying Nimbus is blasted away. As Goku plummets to the ground, Tambourine laughs in triumph. So much for that brat. However, as he attempts to fly away to continue his hunt, he is punched square in the jaw. What was that? He couldn't even register what had hit him. He looks around as Tambourine is shocked at what he sees. A grinning Goku floating in the air without a cloud. Thanks to his spirit control training, as well as witnessing Chaozu and Tien fly during the tournament, Goku was able to replicate the sky dancing technique. He still had trouble figuring out how to fly and fight at the same time, but Goku quickly adapted. His attacks were now connecting, and each hit struck like a freight train. Tambourine was becoming more and more desperate. He never expected a battle in the air. Especially against someone this strong. Despite this, Tambourine still chortles with glee. You think you're special because you're giving me a hard time? Well, you're dead wrong. My father is the great and terrible Demon King Piccolo. He can't be stopped. His power will make the world tremble in fear. Even if I die, he'll come looking for you and kill you dead. Oh yeah? Is that a promise? You're right about one thing. You're gonna die! Goku charges his key, ready to end this battle once and for all. 
he fires a devastating Kamehameha that Tambourine swiftly dodges. However, as the monster starts to taunt his foe, Goku yells out that he isn't done yet. The young boy lifts his hands, bending the Kamehameha beam straight back to Tambourine. The monster screams in shock and pain as he is quickly vaporized. Goku pants, exhausted but content. He was able to get revenge for his best buddy. Really? If only he had run back to the tournament in time, he'd still be alive. Wait a minute. That's right! The Dragon Ball! Goku was so preoccupied in defeating Tambourine, he completely forgot about the Dragon Ball. Goku checks out the Dragon Radar, and to his relief, he sees it being detected below him. He was worried it broke from the force of the Kamehameha. Goku drops down to the jungle beneath him in search of the missing Dragon Ball. During his search, Goku realizes just how hungry he is. He hadn't eaten anything since before the tournament, and he fought in so many intense battles, of course he'd be starving. Thankfully, he finds some cooking fish over an open fire and devours it without much thought. Just as he finished eating his meal, a boulder is thrown his way that Goku barely avoids. It was the wandering samurai, Yajirobe. He was furious that some snot-nosed kid stole his food. Goku tries to apologize, but he notices the Dragon Ball hanging from his chest. That was the one star, the other Dragon Ball the radar picked up. Goku tries to negotiate for the ball, but, unsurprisingly, it doesn't work. Yajirobe refused to hand over the ball, and threatened to beat down Goku if he didn't give him back his fish. A battle breaks out, and although Yajirobe isn't able to land a single hit, Goku is impressed with how tough the Ronin is. Maybe he could have fun with this. Unfortunately for our hero, the battle is interrupted by a flying dragon. It was Symbol, yet another one of King Piccolo's children. The demon demands to see the one who killed his brother Tambourine. Goku steps up, revealing that he was the one who stopped that wing guy. He's ready to fight him and anyone else who gets in the way of him reviving Krillin. Symbol notices the Dragon Ball on Yajirobe's chest and demands he hand it over. If he does, his life might be spared. Yajirobe refuses, and after a quick game of rock, paper, scissors with Goku, he approaches the monster. Another battle begins that is hastily ended with a quick slice from Yajirobe's sword. Symbol is defeated, and Goku is amazed at the Ronin's power. He bets even Tien would have a tough time against him. Tien, the tournament, his friends! He almost forgot! They were still waiting for him at the tournament arena! He was so mad, he didn't even listen to what his master was trying to tell him. Maybe he knows something about this King Piccolo guy. After quickly finding the Dragon Ball tambourine dropped with the Dragon Radar, Goku asks Yajirobe if he'd like to come with him to the Tenkaichi Budokai. Yajirobe wasn't interested, he was more worried about finding more food. Goku mentions that there will probably be a lot of food after he finds his friends, and Yajirobe's attitude completely changes. He'd never say no to a free meal after all. Yajirobe has heard of the tournament before, and wagers that it'll probably take a couple of days to reach that place from here. However, before he can even take out his capsule car, Yajirobe nearly has a heart attack when he sees Goku floating in midair. The monkey boy laughs. It'd be much easier if they just fly. Just get on his back. Yajirobe hops on and yells at him to not let go as the boy comments that he's heavier than he looks. Goku wobbles in the air thinking to himself that he'll have to be pretty careful flying back. But, before he takes off, Goku feels something. Something horrible. A key presence stronger. 
darker and fouler than anything he had ever felt before was heading his way. Goku nearly drops Yajirobe in shock. Goku could tell there was no way he could beat that guy on his own. Was this that King Piccolo he heard about? Goku wanted to fight, but he knew he'd die if he fought him now. And he had the Dragon Balls. He needed to bring them to his friends first, so they could bring back Krillin. Goku tells Yajirobe to hold on tight, and before he can even respond, the samurai screams in fright as the pair rocket into the sky. Moments later, a massive flying fortress arrives at the jungle. From inside, the towering figure of the Demon King Piccolo looms overhead. He grits his teeth in frustration. This was definitely the location where his children had perished. Yet, he didn't see anyone. He turns around to the diminutive and terrified Pilaf, coldly requesting an explanation for this. Was this not the location where his sons were slain? Pilaf stutters that yes, this was the correct coordinates. But more important than that, the two Dragon Ball signals that his satellite indicated were here are gone now. Whoever killed a tambourine and symbol, they must have taken the Dragon Balls and left. Piccolo curses under his breath. What kind of animal is capable of eliminating two of his children this quickly? From the shadows, a lone figure states that he only knows of one martial artist who could be capable of such a feat. That turtle school student, Son Goku. Piccolo is confident that he's strong enough to be any lowly human, but the mysterious figure warns his master that he shouldn't underestimate Son Goku. He is a prodigy who has mastered techniques it took him and his former rival decades to learn. Not only that, he believes that his master, the turtle hermit Roshi, may know the dreaded Mafuba technique. Piccolo is frightened upon hearing that name. Was he absolutely sure? The figure chuckles as he steps out of the shadows, his crane hat bouncing in the wind. Master Shen not. Roshi was the only one who knew their old master Mutaito's ultimate technique. It would be wise to eliminate him as soon as possible, before he ever has a chance to strike. The Demon King quickly regains his composure. It seems that his first task is to eliminate these Turtle School fighters before they ever have a chance to seal him. Piccolo spits out an egg, disgusting Shen and the Pilaf gang. As the egg starts to hatch, Shen cackles. He can't wait to see the Demon King wipe out the Turtle School and those foolish students of his that betrayed him. His revenge would soon become a reality. Sometime later, Goku and Yajirobe finally arrive at the World Tournament Grounds. Goku's friends were very happy to see him again. They were worried something bad happened to him. Goku was surprised to see Tien and Chiaotzu. He didn't think they'd stick around. Goku apologizes to everyone, especially Master Roshi. I'm sorry, Master Roshi. I didn't mean to worry you, but I was able to beat that flying guy, and look, I even got two Dragon Balls. Roshi doesn't respond at first, but he takes off his glasses and goes in for a hug. Goku was surprised, but he feels glad. This was a warm hug like Grandpa Gohan used to give him. He hugs back softly and gives him a big smile. It's all right, Master. It'll take a lot more than stinky old lizards to take me down. All I ask of you is to please be careful of yourself and your emotions. A martial artist is only as strong as his mind as well as his body. I beg you, Goku. Do not descend down the dark path of vengeance. I have seen 
many good men fall to the temptation of violence and anger. All it leads to is corruption and pain to not only others, but for yourself as well. Okay, I promise not to do it again. This reminds Goku about what he had sensed before. He warns everyone about the malignant power he felt earlier, which confirms Roshi's worst fears. Somehow, the Demon King Piccolo had returned. Yadromi starts asking where the food is, as Goku's stomach grumbles. Bruh. Oh yeah, he did promise that. Goku introduces everyone to Yadrobi, a guy he met in the woods, who's as tough as him. He even be one of those demon guys. Everyone looks on in shock as Yadrobi looks at them, asking that they better give him a good feast soon. Bulma promises to throw the biggest feast possible if they survive this. This is enough to convince Yadrobi to stay. The group decided to head to Kame House for the night, which Goku was fine with since he could just raid the fridge. The next morning, everyone gathers around the living room to discuss what to do next. They ask Goku if he learned anything from that monster that killed Krillin. Goku tells him that the flying guy wasn't super tough, but before he died, he bragged about his dad being very strong. Goku admits that he felt his energy, and it was really big. He doubts he'd be able to beat him on his own. Oh, and he was holding some papers with faces of tough-looking guys on them before he was defeated. Bulma realizes that those papers must have been the list of World Tournament contestants that the announcer told them about. Roshi's theory must have been right. The demons really are on the hunt for martial artists. Thankfully, Goku was able to defeat Tambourine before he had a chance to return those papers to the Demon King. They still have some time left to prepare. They had time to gather the Dragon Balls. Tien speaks up, wondering what this talk about dragons and balls were all about. The legend of the Dragon Balls is explained, which stuns Tien, Chaozu, and Yajirobe. Such a thing really exists? And this is what King Piccolo wanted? Who knows what that monster's wish could be? Roshi bets that their best course of action is to find the Dragon Balls first before the demons can. Bulma asks Goku if he still has the radar, and sure enough, he does. The gang are relieved. Now Bulma doesn't have to spend an entire day building a new one. Well, everyone except for Yajirobe. The samurai panics. He wants absolutely nothing to do with them anymore. Not when King Piccolo is involved. However, Yamcha points out that if they don't stop King Piccolo now, the whole world as they know it will be destroyed. And so, the plan was set. They would gather the Dragon Ball and summon Shenron to defeat King Piccolo once and for all. Goku was a bit upset that he can't get a chance to fight, but even he had to admit that this pickle guy pickle. was way too strong for him to handle right now. The heroes depart to gather the Dragon Balls, and over the course of the day, they manage to find four of them. They have six of the Dragon Balls in total. But where could the last one be? It won't show up on the radar. What could this mean? Without any leads, the Z Fighters decide to regroup a Kame House to rest and gather more information. Unfortunately, when they arrive, they hear the loud, booming sounds of thunderclaps. Goku is the first to react, yelling at everyone to get down as lightning strikes the hut. Kame House is set ablaze as it quickly burns to the ground. Goku and Tien are able to protect their friends from the blast and evacuate as a round demon appears on the beach. It was Drum, another child of King Piccolo. Yamcha asks how the hell he was able to get to this island as Drum chuckles. He points behind himself as he tells them he simply ran here. Yamcha is stunned. He just ran through the ocean? 
This drum isn't as strong as the one shown in the original story. He was born before Piccolo had regained his youth, which means he isn't as powerful as he should be. However, he is still a formidable foe. Drum tells the heroes that he's here for the Dragon Balls. If they hand it over, he'll give them a quick, painless death. They refuse. As Yamcha approaches the demon, he wasn't going to allow him to leave here alive after threatening his friends like that. The drum snickers. He likes to play with his prey anyways. Yamcha and Tien tell Goku to let them handle this, and he nods. Goku stands back alongside Yajirobe to protect the rest of their friends. As the pair get into their battle stances, Yamcha and Tien are shocked to see Drum just disappear. Where did he go? Suddenly, they are swiftly punched in the head and sent grinding against the sand. Drum is strong and lightning fast, overwhelming Yamcha and Tien. However, he was caught completely overconfident about his speed. His movements were starting to become predictable, and Tien exploited this. As Drum prepares to launch another sneak attack, Tien steps back and sticks out his fist towards where he thinks the beast will go. The gambit pays off, as the villain is struck in the gut. Drum staggers back, impressed at his strength. But before he can make another rude comment, he is struck again by Yamcha. The duo wastes no time in using this opportunity, repeatedly striking him in a flurry of blows. When Drum tries to fire another lightning bolt from his hands, Tien is able to redirect the blast back at the demon. He is electrocuted with his own attack, leaving him wide open. With a combined volleyball fist and wolf fang fist, Drum is sent flying upwards before getting slammed back down into the ocean. As Drum emerges from the water, he is shot straight through the eyes with a precise Dodon Paw, ending him. As the heroes celebrate their victory, Goku and Roshi sense something awful approaching them. It's Piccolo! He's on his way! Bulma checks the dragon radar and notices a signal also heading towards them. Piccolo really did have the last Dragon Ball. If they fail to stop him, nothing would prevent the Demon King from getting his wish. This would have to be their last stand. But should they really fight on this tiny island? The Z Fighters prepare to head towards another, larger island nearby, as Bulma and the other non-combatants are told to retreat. Tien and Chaozu notice Roshi digging through the rubble of his home, wondering why in the world he became so happy when he found a rice cooker? Was it expensive or something? Yajirobe tries to leave with Bulma, but Launch yells at him to get a grip and fight like a man. Yamcha and Bulma have a tearful goodbye as she tells everyone that they better win. Goku gives her a thumbs up as the martial artists head off to their final destination. Previously, Krillin? Krillin! What's wrong, Krillin? Wake up! Wake up! Huh? Who are you, bozos? <laughs> you don't know who we are? Let us show you. My name is Tambourine! Symbol! Drum! And we are the, the Piccolo, Piccolo Force! Force. Poopa Stinka! What? As the heroes arrive on the island and wait for Piccolo, Tien asks Goku if they think they can win. Goku sweats as he tells everyone that he doesn't think he can take on the Demon King alone. But if they all fight together, then they might have a chance. Yamcha is nervous. If even Goku was worried, then what chance do they have? However, Roshi puts his hand on Yamcha's shoulder. 
Did you already forget what I taught you? Martial arts was created to defend oneself against threats many times greater than ourselves. If we believe in our martial arts and each other's abilities, there's nothing we can't accomplish. Now, let's focus on devising a strategy, shall we? A plan was set. They would hide the Dragon Balls and Chiaotzu somewhere safe. As they distract Piccolo, they will try to steal the last Dragon Ball from him and hand it over to Chiaotzu. Then, he can summon Shenron and wish for the Demon King to be defeated. It wasn't a foolproof plan, and anything could go wrong, but it was all they had. Yet, Tien had his doubts that this was really their only plan. Could Roshi possibly know a way to defeat Piccolo? He must have brought that rice cooker for a reason. As the sun starts to set, Goku and Yamcha look up to the sky. Despite the pep talk from earlier, the young man was still filled with anxiety. Yamcha questions if he's nervous, and Goku replies that yeah, a little. But more than that, he just can't help but be excited. He was going to have a chance to fight someone really strong. Yamcha laughs. Even in a situation like this, Goku can still be just so confident and optimistic. Goku looks back at the sky and mentions how it's a shame the moon is gone. If it wasn't, maybe that moon monster could show up and stomp on that Piccolo guy. Yamcha laughs nervously, stammering that it's probably for the best that the moon isn't around anymore. Goku suddenly bolts up as he feels a dark presence. A massive flying fortress hovers overhead, and from out of the top, an enormous figure emerges. King Piccolo has arrived! Roshi checks the radar and, of course, the last Dragon Ball was up above them. King Piccolo chuckles, pulling out the ball from his pocket and asking if they were looking for this. With a sadistic grin, he swallows the ball whole. The Z Fighters look on in shock and despair, as Roshi shakes in anger. They couldn't count on Shenron to save the day. They'd have to somehow defeat Piccolo on their own. Piccolo drops down from the airship, crashing into the ground and leaving a small crater in his wake. The elderly demon taunts the fighters for being pathetic, idiotic weaklings. Do they really think they stand a chance against the horrible Demon King Piccolo? He knows they're hiding those Dragon Balls. If they hand over their balls now, he will give them the generous gift of a quick death. Roshi retorts that they will do no such thing. It will be himself and his students that will get rid of him for good. Piccolo laughs, getting into a battle stance as he requests them to not break so easily. Roshi yells at his students to stay sharp and focused. If they slip up just once, they will die here. The martial artists and Piccolo clash. Chiaotzu can only look on in awe from his hiding spot at the power on display. As part of their plan, Goku and Roshi rush down Piccolo as Yamcha and Tien provide support with Ki Blasts and Kamehamehas. Piccolo isn't able to keep up with all these overwhelming waves of attacks. Every time he blocks strikes from Goku and Roshi, he gets blasted with Ki. Whenever he attempts to guard against an incoming key attack or fire his own blast at Yamcha or Tien, he gets struck down with a flurry of blows. However, what was more astonishing was Goku and Roshi's ability to seemingly dodge every single hit Piccolo tries to make. It was as if they could tell what Piccolo was going to do before he did. They had become untouchable, impenetrable defenses. And all that did was make the demon angrier, which gave them more opportunities to attack. Master Roshi looks on in amazement. They were actually dealing damage to Piccolo. They were dodging all of his attacks. Perhaps they really don't need the Mafuba after all. 
Unfortunately, the tides of battle are changed the moment someone cries out in pain. The heroes turn around and spot Chiaotzu, badly beaten and bruised, as he is held up by someone familiar to them. It was none other than Master Shen, the Crane Hermit. Shen snickers as he tells the Demon King that he had found this sneaky rat along with the remaining Dragon Balls. Tien and Roshi are mortified at what they hear. What the hell was he doing? Roshi is absolutely livid, yelling out to his former comrade, calling him a fool for thinking he could possibly work with a devil like Piccolo. Does he not remember what he and his spawn did to their dojo? Had he forgotten their master's sacrifice? Doesn't he know what this monster will do if he gets his way? Shen shrieks at Roshi to shut up! He doesn't care anymore! He used to be a grand martial arts master of the greatest dojo in the world, but he and his blasted turtle school humiliated him beyond belief. That Goku brat killed his brother Tao and made a mockery of his entire school. He demonstrated techniques and a fundamental understanding of martial arts he could never comprehend. Not even his own students were safe from Roshi. His words wormed their way into their brains. They abandoned him. He was left all alone with nothing. All he had left was his hate. If he was meant to have nothing, while Roshi had everything, then it was only fitting for this world to be burned to the ground. It was him that freed the Demon King from his prison. He was the one to suggest hunting down the World of Martial Arts contestants. Even if the whole world was reduced to ash, he'd be fine with that, as long as he got to witness the death of the Turtle School. From up above on the Flying Fortress, Piano and the anxious Pilaf gang observe the battle. In a flashback, we are shown that the Pilaf gang, who were already searching for the Mafu Basile, had arrived just as Shen unleashed the Demon King, and, in an attempt to save their lives, offered the pair their flying fortress and the legend of the Dragon Balls. Although they did want to conquer the world, a part of them was secretly rooting for Goku to beat their new boss. Enraged beyond belief, Roshi lunges at Shen. The Crane Hermit threatens to kill Chiaotzu if he steps any closer, but a surprise fight from Chiaotzu causes the old master to drop him. Roshi orders his students to continue attacking Piccolo. Shen was his responsibility. This was his fight. Shen snorts. This was finally his chance to eliminate his most hated rival once and for all. As Roshi and Shen clash, Piccolo looks over at the remaining Turtle students. He snickers, commending them for putting up more of a resistance than he expected. But if they thought they were making any progress, then they were sorely mistaken. He hadn't taken this battle seriously yet. Tien and Yamcha are horrified, but Goku looks on with fierce determination. He could sense his key. He knew he wasn't using his full power. As Piccolo takes off his cape, Goku gulps. It was time for the real battle to begin. Now at full power, Piccolo is able to easily turn the tables. Goku's speed fast advantage was gone. The elderly demon was far faster than he could have ever imagined. It was only thanks to his key sensing that Goku was barely able to dodge his deadly strikes by the skin of his teeth. Yamcha tried to find an opening to jump in and help, but he couldn't find any. If he went in haphazardly, he'd be torn apart in an instant. Tien felt helpless. Here he was, once again completely outclassed. Yet, he refused to sit back and give up. Shen mocked Roshi, belittling his students, confident that their efforts would be futile. However, Roshi snarled back that he had the utmost faith in the next generation. They would break their limits and rise to the occasion. At that moment, Tian resolved to use his forbidden technique. He places his hands together, electricity crackling around him as he warns Yamcha to get back. Goku continued dodging Piccolo's attacks until he noticed what Tien was doing. 
Tien yells at Goku to dodge, who responds by jumping high up into the air. Tien unleashes the mighty Kikoho as Goku responds in turn with his own Kamehameha. The demon was completely covered in a bright blue and yellow light, followed by a massive explosion. The force of the blast was so immense, it damaged the flying fortress hovering overhead. It spiraled out of control, crashing into the nearby ocean. Piano was no more, yet the Pilaf gang were able to survive by jumping off the fortress at the nick of time. Now, there was only one question left on everyone's mind. Was it over? Had they won? Was the Demon King finally defeated? However, from the smoke, a beam shoots out and strikes Goku in the air! Tien cries out a sorrowful no as a laugh echoes across the field. Even with a devastating combined attack, Piccolo is able to take them head on. Piccolo wasn't unscathed, he did take some damage, yet he still found the energy to cackle maliciously. In rapid succession, the heroes fell apart. Tien and Yamcha attempt to rush down Piccolo, but they are dispatched effortlessly. Roshi attempts to intervene, but at every turn, he is stopped by a snickering shed. Keep your eyes on your opponent, you see, Nile old coot! Death will follow you soon enough! Chaozu can only stand there and watch, paralyzed in fear, as Piccolo continues torturing his downed opponents with sadistic glee. However, when he attempts to finish off Tien with a mouth beat, Chaozu finds the strength to leap forward and take the blast. Tien's eyes widen as his dearest friend sacrifices himself to save his life. Piccolo laughs cruelly. That little idiot gave his life for nothing. Yet, Piccolo doesn't kill the rest. No, he still saw the fight in his victim's eyes. He wants them all to fall into despair once they see what's about to happen. As Roshi lands a decisive blow on Shen, he notices Piccolo approaching the Dragon Balls. Realizing that his students had failed, it was up to Roshi to make the ultimate sacrifice. Perhaps this was always meant to be. Roshi shouts out to Piccolo, asking if he remembers who he is. What? Why would I remember the face of a lowly human? You see, the last time we met, I was with my master. Would you like to know his name? It was Mutaito! What? No, it can't be! Piccolo panics, sweating profusely the moment he hears that name. Roshi pulls out a capsule and clicks it, taking out his rice cooker. Piccolo gasps and shudders in fear. It, it couldn't be! This was the one that the Crane Coward warned him about. Goku and Yamcha don't understand what's going on, but Tien deduces that his hunch was right. Master Roshi really did have a secret technique up his sleeve. But why would he keep this a secret? Piccolo fires a laser beam to destroy the Mafuba container. He wouldn't be trapped again. Fortunately for our heroes, Yamcha, realizing that whatever his master was doing was important, charges in and takes a hit to protect the rice cooker. A loud snap is heard as Yamcha's leg is snapped from the intense force. Roshi thanks his pupil as he roars. Roshi performs the Mafuba, creating a swirling emerald vortex that snags the Demon King, slamming him down and successfully trapping Piccolo in the rice cooker. Finally, the war was almost over. However, before the seal could be placed, the jar is blasted apart as Piccolo emerges once more. An exhausted Roshi looks on in pure shock as he turns around to see Shen with his fingers outstretched. Shen had fired a Dodon Pa to destroy the jar. Roshi shakes, calling Shen a fool that had doomed them all as he falls onto the ground. Like this, Shen snickers. He had finally killed that old coot. How long had he dreamed of this moment? Yamcha and Tien are enraged. But Goku? He just 
can't process what just happened. There was no way that his master just died, right? No, it was all a trick. It had to be. Any moment now, Roshi would get back up and use that green toilet move again. Piccolo congratulates his subordinate, spitting out the final Dragon Ball that he had swallowed earlier. Now, he had all seven. Piccolo calls forth Shenron as the sky turns dark, summoning the Eternal Dragon. Tien uses telepathy to contact the only martial artist left standing, Yajirobe. Hiding behind a rock the whole time, Yajirobe panics when he hears a voice in his head. But Tien begs him to calm down and steal the wish from Piccolo. This was their only chance to stop him before it was too late. All he had to do was yell out to wish for Piccolo's death. Unfortunately, Yajirobe absolutely refused. He was too scared. He didn't want to die. The Demon King wastes no time as he wishes to be granted eternal youth. In an instant, his skin smoothens and his power skyrockets. His wish was granted! For his efforts, Shenron is immediately destroyed. Tien, Yamcha, and Yajirobe are left absolutely dumbstruck. The Dragon Balls were gone, and Piccolo was stronger than ever before. They were surely doomed. All the while, Goku can only look at the body of Roshi, struggling to move as he begs his master to get up. Shen laughs triumphantly, demanding that Piccolo kill those turtle brats and the ones who betrayed him. He fulfilled his end of the bargain. It was time for the Demon King to fulfill his. However, Piccolo instead smiles, grabbing Shen's head and lifting him up. He's grown tired of his incessant squawking. He would be rewarded with a merciful death. Ah, Shen squeals ah. in fear as a hand pierces his chest, killing him instantly. Piccolo had a total victory, without a shadow of a doubt. The situation was utterly hopeless, but from the Valley of Despair, a single boy rises. Despite all the pain and the loss, Son Goku refused to give up. Last time on Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> Look, whatever you're planning, I ain't buying you. <laughs> well, have you forgotten who I am? I'm King Piccolo, yo. The Demon King Piccolo, yo. Uh-huh. Pussy. You want to blame something? Blame your own. Piccolo! Win! Tien, Yamcha, and Yajirobe are left absolutely dumbstruck. The Dragon Balls were gone, and Piccolo was stronger than ever before. They were surely doomed. All the while, Goku can only look at the body of Roshi, struggling to move as he begs his master to get up. Shen laughs triumphantly, demanding that Piccolo kill those turtle brats and the ones who betrayed him. He fulfilled his end of the bargain. It was time for the Demon King to fulfill his. However, Piccolo instead smiles, grabbing Shen's head and lifting him up. He's grown tired of his incessant squawking. He would be rewarded with a merciful death. Ah, 
Shen squeals in fear as a hand pierces his chest, killing him instantly. Piccolo had a total victory, without a shadow of a doubt. The situation was utterly hopeless, but from the Valley of Despair, a single boy rises. Despite all the pain and the loss, Son Goku refused to give up. Piccolo was surprised, yet intrigued. You pathetic whelp! Do you still want to fight despite seeing my glorious new body? You're as stupid as you are weak! You monster! I get it now. Master Roshi died trying to stop you! Krillin died because of you! Give them back! Give me back my friends! Listen here, brat. Have a free lesson before you head to the afterlife. The weak don't get to make demands from the strong. Take that rat with the hat over there. I only let him live because he was useful to me. The moment he stopped being useful, I decided to kill him. Simple as that. But he was your comrade! Your friend! Friend? <laughs> now that's a good joke if I've ever heard one. I know no such thing as comrades or friendship. Those are ridiculous notions invented by pathetic humans who couldn't survive by themselves. This is why humanity was born to be slaves. These weak ideals have no place in a demon's world. As long as you cling to your humanity and this weak, sentimental naivety, you're destined to kneel before me. Evil is strength, boy. Evil is absolute. Unless you can make your heart utterly cold and embrace evil, you can never hope to defeat me. Goku feels many emotions bubbling up within him. Rage, fear, despair, sadness, and mix within them all. Excitement? He couldn't understand what he was feeling, but he knew he was on the verge of falling apart at the seams. The last remaining turtle student tried to compose himself, thinking back to his spirit control training with Mutaito. He needed to move without thinking. Now more than ever, Goku recalls his words about staying calm and not succumbing to his mortal desires such as revenge. But how can he stay calm? Goku looks around to see his friends down on the ground, injured and broken. He sees the dead bodies of Chiaotzu, Roshi, and Shen, recalling the emotions he felt when he first discovered Krillin's body. His emotions were swelling to the surface. He couldn't contain himself anymore. Beyond that, it seemed as if the overwhelming aura of evil he had been sensing from Piccolo was seeping into Goku's very own spirit. Piccolo's words ring in the young boy's head, drowning out the words of Master Mutaito. If being cold and merciless is what he needs to win, if he needs to become evil to defeat Piccolo, then that's what he'll be! All these factors swirl together in an explosion of raw fury as Goku goes berserk. His eyes widening out as he lunges at the Demon King with wild ferocity. Piccolo is surprised to see this brat deciding to fight him. Didn't he realize how outmatched he was? However, Piccolo slowly starts to realize that Goku wasn't fighting like a martial artist anymore. He was attacking him like a feral animal that wanted to maul him to death. It made his moves unpredictable, and even worse, he was stronger than he was before. Sure, this brat could hurt him a bit when he was still old, but Piccolo was in his prime now. How could this insignificant flea be able to still damage him like this? Tien, Yamcha, and Yajirobe couldn't believe what they were seeing. Yes. Piccolo was being pushed back, but something was very wrong. This wasn't the kind and honest Goku they knew. Yet, this second wind was short-lived. Piccolo starts to adapt to Berserk Goku's movements. He may have become stronger, but his attacks were simple and predictable. It was much easier to hurt him now than before when he was still loosened. 
Pig Galil starts to turn the tide of battle with brutal and heavy strikes until, eventually, he defeats Goku once more. For the next hour, he beats Goku to within an inch of his life as the sun sets overhead, darkness enveloping the land. He lifts up Goku into the air, laughing maniacally as he tells the boy he did a fantastic job of testing his newfound powers. Piccolo laments that it's a shame that such a ferocious monkey like this has to perish. He could have been useful in his new army. However, he can't risk letting any martial artist live. Yamcha and Tien struggle to get up. They couldn't sit back and let their friend die like this. Piccolo prepares to strike Goku, asking him if he has any final words before his life is snuffed out. Goku stares daggers at Piccolo as his rage bubbles up once more. Goku could sense the evil within Piccolo's heart, and its depths of darkness was suffocating. It was putrid, rancid, and agonizing to feel. It threatened to corrupt Goku's soul even more. As Goku's anger rose, he looked over at something that was shining above the sky. Goku looks up, and almost as if triggered, his wrathful expression dropped to a dull, emotionless stare. Piccolo is confused once more. Has this child's spirit finally broken? Did he break this boy's mind? Tien and Yajirobe couldn't tell what was happening, but Yamcha, he understood. But he couldn't believe it! It wasn't possible! The moon was gone! Master Roshi made sure of it! Yet, there was no mistake. Somehow, some way, the moon had returned to the night sky, illuminating the island down below. Through a strained breath, Yamcha warns Tien to find the strength to move and get out of here as fast as he can. Tien and Piccolo looked on, even more confused than before until Goku's body started to contort. Fangs grew from Goku's mouth as his body started to expand and stretch out. Piccolo lets go of Goku as his weight and pressure nearly immobilizes him. The evil demon king, Yamcha, Tien, and Yajirobe watch on in terror and disbelief as Goku transforms into a Nozaru for the first time in many years. Ozaru Goku rampages as his very roars shake the island they are standing on. The giant monkey locks eyes with Piccolo, and from somewhere deep within him, the beast feels an unyielding rage. Piccolo was barely able to dodge an incoming stomp as he becomes the target of the behemoth. As Piccolo struggles to stay alive, Yajirobe runs away from his hiding spot as he rushes towards the injured Tien and Yamcha. He picks up the bodies of Chaozu and Roshi, telling the remaining Z Fighters that they have to get out of here. However, Yamcha refuses to leave Goku behind. He knows his weakness, it's his tail. As long as they cut off his tail, they can return Goku back to normal. He volunteers to be the one to cut off the tail, but Tien refuses. He was far too hurt to move. Yamcha was adamant, he had to save his friend. Goku has been there for him for so long, it's up to him to bring Goku back! As the heroes struggle with what to do, the Demon King continues his battle against the Great Ape. Piccolo attempts to launch attacks at the Ozaru, but they do no damage. He was infuriated that his new, immense power seemed to do nothing against this brutish ape. Piccolo charges his key into one massive key blast at full power. It lands, and the force of the blast knocks everyone back. A massive mushroom cloud forms in the sky. But as Piccolo laughs maniacally, red eyes flash through the smoke as a massive fist crashes right into Piccolo. The Ozaru roars as he slams his fist repeatedly at the demon. Piccolo was left broken, both physically and mentally. It was over. Yet, not everything was as bleak as it seemed. Piccolo chokes out blood, laughing weakly as he states that even if he can't bring ruin to this world, Goku will fulfill his dark desire for destruction. 
However, he still hasn't given up yet. Piccolo spits out one final egg that flies through the skies. His final act is swiftly ignored as Ozaru Goku grabs Piccolo and picks him up. The beast feels an enormous amount of fury as he stares at the demon. The giant monkey roars once more. <laughs> you blasted baboon! Just you wait. My hatred will not disappear from this world. The seeds of my evil have been planted. <laughs> One day, I will have my revenge. Wait, what are you doing? No, no, no! Piccolo lets out a blood-curdling scream as the Ozaru slams his mouth shut and chews. In one single, horrific move, the mighty and terrible Demon King was no more. With Piccolo dead, the massive Ozaru continues its rampage. Yamcha yells at his friends that they must cut off Goku's tail now, or else he might really destroy the world. Despite having a broken leg, Yamcha tries to stand back up. Tien holds on to him as support as the pair attempt to distract the monster. It was up to Yajirobe to cut off his tail. Yet, there wasn't a single solid opening, and Yajirobe was still terrified. There was no way he could do this. Tien shouts at Yajirobe to calm down. Has he forgotten everything Goku has done for him? He gave up everything to save them. Was he really going to let his friend down? Yajirobe thinks back to when he first met Goku, the first guy who he ever had fun fighting with, and his cheerful smile. Maybe, just maybe, he could be just as brave as that little kid. The duo try to distract the beast, but its roars are able to completely immobilize them. The massive Ozaru stands over Yamcha and Tien, preparing to stomp them like bugs. It seemed like this was the end. Just when it seems like the giant monkey is going to finish them off, it suddenly jerks back. Yajirobe was able to cut off its tail in one quick, clean slice. The massive Ozaru remains motionless before it begins to shrink, reverting back into the little Goku they knew and loved. Goku falls towards the earth, but he is quickly caught by Yajirobe. Goku tries to open his eyes and say something, but in an instant, he passes out. Within a vast field of darkness, a lone boy finds himself alone. There's no one else here. No master. No friends. No anything. Just him, in this land of nothingness and despair. Or was he? In the distance, the boy sees a pillar of purple miasma shoot from the ground. The boy breaks out into a cold sweat, his heart pumping extremely fast. Then, he hears a laugh. A low, cold, malicious laugh that rings throughout the boy's ears. No, it reverberates through his very soul. I will never die. I will never go away. The seeds of evil. I will have what is rightfully mine. Goku wakes up abruptly. He yells out Piccolo's name, ready to fight once again. But he wasn't on the island anymore. He was at a hospital, and surrounding his bed were his friends. Yamcha and Tien were covered in bandages and casts, but other than that, they were okay. Bulma hugs Goku, crying out that they weren't sure he would ever wake up. He is very confused. What happened to King Piccolo? Where was Chaozu and Master Roshi? The room falls silent. They're hesitant to tell him. But Yajirobe says that they can't lie to the kid. He's tough. He can handle it. Yamcha nods in agreement. It's time to tell Goku the truth. 
As the group recounts what happened, a flood of memories rush through Goku's mind. Chaozu and Roshi's death, the destruction of Shenron, the absolute stomping Piccolo gave him. But more than that, Goku is horrified to hear how Piccolo was defeated. He had no idea he was the giant monster that killed his grandpa Gohan. Not only that, he... He ate Piccolo! Goku is frustrated and mad at himself. He didn't want to win like this. He didn't want to hurt his friends. Goku blames himself. This was all because he gave up on moving without thinking and instead surrendered to his anger. His friends tried to comfort Goku, but his feelings of regret and shame remain. He didn't know what to do with himself. His master and his best friend were still dead, and Shenron was gone. But one thing was for sure, he needed to get back to training as soon as possible. Goku tries to stand up, but his friends beg him to lie back down. He suffered so many injuries, he had to rest. Goku claims that he doesn't need anything, all he needs is a sensu bean. The gang isn't sure what he means, but Goku asks Bulma to take him to the land of Korin. The old cat Korin had sensu beans that could heal their wounds in an instant. Bulma wasn't sure about this, but Tien tells her to trust Goku. He surely earned their trust by now. She agrees. And with the help of the latest Capsule Corp playing technology, the Z Fighters soon arrive at Korin's tower. Tien and Yamcha opt to climb the tower despite their injuries. This would serve to be good training. On the other hand, Goku has to convince Yajirobe to carry him up the tower with the promise of the Sensu Beans. He was still mad that he still hadn't gotten his fees like he was promised. Bulma. Launch and Poir wish them luck as the boys climb the tower. It took some time, but eventually, the heroes arrived at the top of Korin Tower. The cat greets Goku and his guests, but Yajirobe is mad. He wants his feast now! The cat hands out several sensu beans and gives one each to the warriors, telling them to consider this their rewards for defeating King Piccolo. Yajirobe feels ripped off. But once they eat their beans, Heal. all their bellies are filled, and their wounds are healed instantly. The gang can't believe it, but Goku is glad to finally be back to his normal self. He asks Korin if he knows what happened with King Piccolo, and the cat nods. He saw the whole thing. Yamja asks the wise cat if he knows if there is any way to bring back Shenron, but Korin isn't sure. Except... Maybe there might be one way. Their ears perk up as Korn explains that the creator of the Dragon Balls was God himself. If they see him, he might just fix the balls. Tien can't believe what he's hearing, and Yadrobi is sure this is a joke. Was God real? Well, if demons were real, then God must be too. Korn explains that only someone strong with a pure heart could see Kami. Certainly, Goku fit the bill. But more than that, the only way to meet Kami is with the power pull, which, thankfully, Goku managed to keep on him, connecting the pull to the very top of Korin Tower. Goku tells the rest of his friends that he's going up to meet Kami and requests that he resurrect Shenron. Korin gives him a bell that labels him worthy to Kami, as Tien, Yamcha, and Yajirobe wish Goku the best of luck. Power pole extends! As the power pole back. extends upwards beyond the clouds, <laughs> Goku smiles for the first time in a while. He was filled with so much hope once more. Hello everyone! Professor Chimp here. This has been Season 1 of What If Goku Unlocked Ultra Instinct Early. It's been a long road to get here, far longer than I would have liked, but I'm glad that this first stretch of the journey is done. A lot has happened in Goku's quest to master moving without thinking, including his first major challenge which he barely survived. 
Will the consequences of his actions come back to haunt him? Only time will tell. I just want to say thank you to everyone who helped make this project come to life. Firstly, thank you to I'm Shadow 007 for voicing Kid Goku throughout this entire series. She does fantastic work and I cannot recommend her enough. If you need a voice actress, please consider her for your work. Next, I'd like to thank my D&D friends for staying up with me until late at night to review my editing progress and keeping me company. It means so much to me, more than y'all know. Lastly, I wanted to thank every single one of you for sticking around for this series for so long. I wouldn't be making this entire series if it wasn't for your support. For now, I'll be taking a short break from you like Goku early to focus on other, much shorter projects. Mainly one-shots of Dragon Ball and... also... well... Maybe something involving pirates. We'll have to wait and see. As a reminder, if you like the stuff I do, please consider joining my Discord server. Over there, I frequently talk to the rest of the Banana Club community, as well as post edits for my videos and discuss potential future what-ifs. Speaking of videos, I'm in the process of creating content for another gaming-focused channel called Dr. Professor Chimp. With October right around the corner, I thought it'd be fitting to release some Five Nights at Freddy's videos in the meantime while I work on my what-ifs. At the time of this recording, the video for the first part should be out by now. This won't be a replacement to my regular channel, nor will it get in the way of my what-if content. I just welcome you guys to join my friends and I as we journey through the haunted halls of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. With a twist. I'd really appreciate it if you did. I'm also considering creating a Patreon page, where I can share all progress for future videos as well as early access to these videos. Maybe I could also do shorter form content? Like a podcast or audio only what ifs? Please let me know your thoughts, questions, or concerns in the comments section down below. I'd love to hear what y'all have to say. If you really like my videos and you want to see more, consider clicking on that like button, subscribe, as well as hitting that bell so you can stay notified of all my future videos. This has been Professor Chimp. Stay safe out there, and I hope to see you guys next time.